we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. All right, talking about jumping in. We don't need you to jump right now, but if you could stand up and get ready to worship the one and only God with us, we would love it. Show 
Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Cross Life Community Church. Thank you, praise team, for helping us worship today. What a blessed day it is. What a blessed week we've had right after Easter. And uh, we're going to do what we've been always doing this year, and that is uh, starting out our service talking about our mission candle. Because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God has given you a mission, a mission to share his good news with other people. We hope we have opportunities to do that. We pray for those opportunities to do that. Unfortunately, I'll be honest with you, I didn't really have that opportunity or I missed that opportunity, probably missed it. But did anybody else in the house have an opportunity to share uh, their faith with Jesus? Anybody? Anybody today? We've got one, one, two, two. Awesome, awesome. So in honor of that, in honor of being on mission, we want to light our mission candle so let me do that today, and as we light it, we remember we are the light of the world when we are shining and telling people about 
God's love and God's mercy and how wonderful that is. And so uh, I also challenge you, too, if you had that opportunity, take it to, to that next step and literally invite people to receive Christ. And really, really just say, hey, you know, you can, if, you, if you like this, if you think this is true, you can ask God right now to be your Savior. And that is the amazing thing about God's love. It is offered to us at all times and present to us to receive. So, well, thank you all for being uh, faithful to be able to share the love of Christ. We're going to go into our opening prayer, our offering prayer as well today as we get the service uh, started and pray about uh, a, a very specific thing. Up on the screen, you see this is one of our churches that we help support, uh, Broken Wall Church there in Baltimore. They actually worship in a school. Well, actually, I don't know if they've even gotten back in since COVID, uh, but uh, they are partnered with a school there in Baltimore. And I actually, if you get our email, I sent out an email about helping them help their teachers for Teacher Appreciation Month uh, up in May. So uh, if we'll be sending that link out again this week. Uh, you, there's a link to Amazon. You can buy gifts for the teachers and help support them in that way. Uh, we're going to probably send, try to send them a gift from our church as well, additionally, to help uh, with that. But uh, we love partnering with this church. They're a wonderful church. And so we want to give you the personal opportunity to do that as well. We want to pray for them today because the offering uh, that we get we don't pass a plate here. We have a box. People give as they come in, as they go out. Even now, sometimes people will get up during this offering time and give. But we want to acknowledge that gift and those givers and just ask God's blessing on it as we do this. And so uh, we want to lift up a special prayer for Broken Wall Church in particular today and know that the monies that we bring in uh, go to help uh, other churches like this that are trying to make an impact for the kingdom. So would you pray with me uh, as we start our, and open our service here today? Father God, thank you so much for this time to worship today. Thank you for this gathering of those that are in your family and for even those that are just trying to check things out, that are seeking and searching. And Lord, we're, we're so grateful for them to be here as well. We pray that as we seek you Lord, your promise will come true. We will find you. And so, Lord, we want to ask a blessing upon this worship time together, but we also want to ask a blessing upon the gift and the giver, those that have given to this ministry for us to be able to put forth the gospel ministry. So we're, we're grateful for each and every hand that, that works towards that for the gifts that are given. We ask that you multiply them. We pray that you bless them, and Lord, that in all things, that you are indeed glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen, amen. Well, we are back in our sermon series uh, in Peter. We took a break there for Easter, uh, but today we're going to be talking about, uh, well, a very interesting verse of Scripture, but we're going to get there. But I heard something that I think several people here can relate to. I know I did personally relate to this. But we all know that we, uh, our, our brain cells die. You know, we, we're losing brain cells all the time. That happens. And, 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 we, and we lose skin cells. You know, our skin regenerates and cells die. And e even our hair, our hair cells die and, and, and kind of fall away. Uh, but I, I did hear, at least for me, I can tell you, my stomach, my fat cells around my stomach, they... I believe, have received Jesus Christ because they seem to have eternal life. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, I'm hearing some amens about that. Yeah, it's like they have eternal life. Well, I can, I can tell you, um, I, I'm not trying to uh, downplay resurrection or eternal life or anything else. I am trying to bring a little bit of levity to today's sermon because today's sermon is, uh, well, it's a tough one. It, 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 it's a scripture that has been debated over quite some bit. We're going to read it right now. Uh, I think you'll get uh, the idea why it's such a difficult scripture. But it'll, it, it, let me read it. It'll be up on the screen. It starts in chapter 1, or chapter, uh, I'm sorry, it should be chapter 3, verse 18 of First Peter. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, 
that he might bring us to God, put it, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. That's the easy part, by the way. Here we go. In which he went and proclaimed to spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patient, uh, God's patient waited in the day of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, but as a removal of dirt from the body, or but not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as a, an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with, a, with angel, angels, authorities, and powers having been subject to him. It sounds like it's talking about Christ's crucifixion there in the beginning, but who, who are these spirits in prison and what is this prison? What did Jesus tell them exactly while they were there? Did that just say that baptism saved me? Doesn't Pastor John always say that baptism doesn't save? Those are probably just a few of the questions that may have gone through your mind with this particular text. <laughs> uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer, said of this text, he said, a wonderful text this is, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any in all the Bible, so that I do not know for certain to just what Peter means. I cannot understand, and I cannot explain it, and there has been no one who has explained it. Well, uh, that's how Martin Luther, the great reformer, thought about this particular passage. Actually, a lot of people have tried to explain this. One commentary I read said 180 different understandings of that particular passage that we just read. So, it is one of those passages. And today, I want to make, I want to make an attempt, essentially, uh, to, to really flesh out what Peter was trying to say to us. I don't want to make this a bunch of complex, uh, speculatory kind of things, though, but I will go down one line of thinking. Uh, but I also want to take what seems to be a pretty confusing verse of Scripture, and I believe Peter does have a very simple message for us today, that he has a message that, that, that will help you and I uh, live out our Christian faith. And so, if I may, let me just pray humbly as we to, uh, go forth on this text. So, pray with me if you would. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Sometimes your words uh, through the scriptures, as divine as they are, are sometimes hard to understand. Many are easy, and the gospel is actually truly simple. But Lord, as we wrestle with this particular passage and what you would want us to take away and what you want us to learn, I humbly come before you and ask your spirit for guidance. I pray that as we look into it, that your spirit would lead and guide each and every person to what it is and how it speaks to, to them and lifts them up in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I read a story about a marine biologist. His name is Bruce Davison. He was in the Pacific Ocean, and he was getting into a one-man submarine that was going to go to the depths of about 1,500 feet below water, the sea level. That's pretty deep, and no light ever makes it down quite that far. The submarine was referred to or called, it had a name, it was called Deep Rover, and while he was down there, he, he was in his little one-man submarine, and he, he had a window to see what was down there. It was just pretty much dark until all of a sudden this rather translucent uh, creature began to swim by him. It was huge. It was almost 120 feet in length, he estimated. It had hundreds of tentacles and what seemed to be like multiple stomachs inside of it. He was amazed. He had never seen anything like this before. Well, all of a sudden then, he didn't just see one. He saw another and another. It had friends. And it surrounded his ship and choked him down and killed him and put him down. No. 
The first part was true. The last part was not true. <laughs> he made his way back out, and, but he did see these things. And the point is this, folks. There are things that are going on around us, okay, that we can't see, that we're completely unaware of them, but they are very, very real. Sometimes we need special equipment to see them. For him, it was a submarine. For us, a lot of times, it's actually Scripture. So, in this, it is in the spiritual world. We don't see the things around us, the spiritual world around us, very clearly a lot of times, but it's still there. Our text today, the one I just read to you, well, it gives us a glimpse of what is going on in the spiritual world around us. I, I remember what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He said, we're not looking... Uh, we, we look not at things that are seen, but things that are unseen, or the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And I think that's a really good un understanding and perspective as we go into this text today. But there's also what I would tell some prerequisites that I don't think you'll really have a problem with today in terms of if you're a Christian and you, you'll believe these things, but I think I'm going to stretch your understanding of them a little bit more today. That, that prerequisite, if you will, is that we are both flesh, okay, we've got body here, and we're spirit, okay? This flesh is mortal, and our spirit is eternal. And I think as a believer in Jesus Christ, most people even it, uh, have that understanding and that belief. And, and there is, again, a spiritual realm around us. And so the spiritual realm being where God is, okay, we say that's heaven. We, Jesus is there, of course. There are things called angels and, and evil spirits or demons, if you will. The Bible also refers to them as powers or principalities, maybe. We read about these in the Scriptures. We do. In fact, 34 of 66 Bibles, over, just over half of the, of the Bible, talks about this spiritual realm and evil demons and, and those type of things. It's mentioned that often. But I, I'm not sure it really sinks in to the depth of what it should for us. This passage, again, I think opens us opens our eyes to what is the unseen world around us, if you will. So the, the way I'm going to attack this text today is, well, first I'm going to talk about the confusing part. I'm going to try to answer as many questions that you might have about this text, and I'm going to give you one, what I f feel is probably the best understanding of this text uh, for us. There's others, and I, I do this with all humility. I, I'm not saying I'm absolutely right on everything here, uh, but I will attempt also then to tie together what Peter's bigger message was when he wrote this and what he was trying to do to the original audience, and I think for us as well uh, as we go into this today. So those are how we're going to approach this. We'll look at the difficult part, then I'll look at the big picture part and share that. So, let's go into the difficult part. We're going to start right back there in verse 18 and 19. The focus will be on the end of 18 and all of 19. He says, therefore, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And then he says, in which he went to proclaim to the spirits in prison. Again, I, I think we understand he's, putting, he's talking about the crucifixion. He was put to death in the flesh. He's made alive in the spirit. He's resurrected, okay, and Jesus is, is spiritually alive. He's fully God. He's fully the Son of God. And then he went to, uh, it says, a prison. <laughs> a prison. What is he talking? Is that hell? Did Jesus go to hell during those three days while he was on the cross? No, it's not hell, and, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more in a little bit. So what is this place? Again, uh, what I want to share here, I, I, it's going to hopefully mesh with the rest of Scripture, um, and I, I encourage you to continue to, to dig into this as we, we go into 
this. So the spirits in prison, who are they? Um, I, I'm going to need to go down a bit of a rabbit trail today. So I hope you have your, you had breakfast, you had coffee, you're listening, because it, 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 is, it is a bit of a, uh, of a rabbit trail, but I really need to do that today. Uh, so please, please do your best to stay with me on this. What we know from Scripture is that we were created, and we also know that God created something called angels. And he created a lot of them, actually. The Bible talks about myriads of angels, multiple, okay? Angels are probably best and most easily described as real beings without a physical body, okay? Even though at times the Bible speaks to them with physical bodies. Listen to this, what the Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews writes He says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawaringly. Wow, what a crazy thought. Anybody ever had that experience? Ever thought like, man, maybe that person was an angel? Yeah, okay. I mean, seems bizarre. I don't know if it ever, I don't know if it's ever happened to me, but you never know. It says it can happen. So they are created beings, and like you and I, angels have free will, okay? We believe that who is referred to in the Bible as Satan was an angel at one time, a great one as a matter of fact. There's two verses of scriptures, one is Isaiah, one is in Ezekiel, that speak to this one that we refer to as Satan, okay? The passages may seem a little obscure, but they do make, I think they make sense. So in the book of Ezekiel, he's talking about an evil king of Tyre. But then he goes and switches and says this. Listen to what it says. You were an anointed guardian cherub. Okay, now he's saying there's an angel involved. Okay, I, I placed you. You were on a holy mountain of God in the midst of the stone of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. So literally what I think he's talking about is that there was uh, a, an angel that was moving and using and going through and working through this evil king of Tyre. And he refers to him right here very specifically. In the book of Isaiah, it's chapter 14, I'm not going to look at the particular passage, but it goes on to talk about the, the, this particular angel falling from heaven, Okay. And in a complete and total rebellion against God. Again, we believe this to be Satan most likely. In fact, in Luke's gospel, chapter 10, Jesus even refers to this uh, angel falling from heaven. And so, again, we see a little bit of confirmation within the New Testament as well in Jesus' own words. But we also uh, see in the book of Revelation, there's a... there's an inference, or if you were, it infers that approximately one-third of the angels in heaven uh, were left or kicked out of heaven, one-third of them. That, that reference is a little obscure, but a lot of people believe that. Satan's leadership has evil angels, evil demons. They're actually kind of organized, if you will. It seems that way, at least. The Apostle Paul, Paul, again, talks about this this unknown and unseen spiritual battle that takes place. He says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers or principalities, depending on your interpretation there, uh, over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. There's a spiritual battle literally going on. And and, in that particular list we just read there about principalities or or authorities and powers, we read that in the text we read today in, in, in verse 22 about the authorities and powers. And so there is a coexisting spiritual world that sometimes we don't really even think about. We're so busy being in this world. But there is a spiritual world. There's there's a wonderful story in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, that again opens this window up. And and Daniel was praying uh, for some wisdom and some insight 
in chapter 10, and the, the angel finally makes it to Daniel. And this is what the angel says. He says, from the day you started praying, Daniel, I was sent to you to give you insight. It took 21 days because I had to fight the prince of Persia. And he goes on to say, in fact, Angel Michael, you've heard of him? He had to help this angel defeat the prince of Persia. And again, so we, we, we see this idea and this, well, reality that we don't see, that there's an invisible war going on. Another big concept to keep in mind, and that is Satan has had a plan to win the battle. The, the plan really has been in his mind, and a lot of times we can see this in the Scriptures, to stop the Messiah from coming, to, to get rid of the Masonic line, if you will. And so, literally, we see this. It starts in the fall, Genesis chapter 3. We know the verse. You've heard me preach on it before. You've probably heard it elsewhere, where he talks about God is talking to Satan and says, look, uh, you're going you're gonna to bite my heel, okay, but I'm going to crush your head. A lot worse injury. And so that was essentially the beginning where God had said, look, I'm going to destroy you. But, and it actually goes on to talk about through the, a line, through a son, is what he says. And so this is played out. It's played out throughout the, the Bible. We see Satan working through Pharaoh, trying to kill all the Jewish bait male children, right? But one survived, got picked up by Pharaoh's daughter. The line goes on. I can't remember the name of the, the, the queen, but there was an evil queen in, in uh, Israel's history. She killed all her sons except for one named Joash, and he became king at the age of eight years old. If you remember in the, in the book of Esther, a guy named Haman wanted to wipe out the entire Jewish nation. Satan's plan was trying to get them all out. Didn't work. We go even into Jesus' time. What happened when, when Jesus was born, right? Well, all the male children were to be killed. But, well, Joseph got a <laughs> word from an angel to go and hide. You see, this has been Satan's plan, if you will, to try to, well, not have his head crushed. And, and I give you all this background because it does play into what we're going to learn today. So let's jump into verse 19 where it says, in which he went to proclaim to the spirits in prison. What prison is he talking about? Again, I, it is not really hell as we think and know about it of eternal lake of fire that is described in Roman, or Revelation chapter 20. But it is a word that is sometimes translated uh, the bottomless pit or the abyss. It is a place for fallen angels. It, you remember the story of Jesus when he was casting out some demons um, out of a man, and they said to Jesus, don't throw us in the abyss. And they threw him in a bunch of pigs and they jumped over the cliff, right? These angels know about this place, this prison. They said, don't throw us there. So it's not hell in those things, in those terms, but it is a place, a prison for evil angels. The book of Jude speaks of this. In, chat, in verse 6, it says, the, angel, the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal change under gloomy darkness under the judgment of that great day, or until the judgment of the great day. He's talking about angels that are kept in a gloomy prison. Seems odd. It says they didn't stay in their own position, and that's a key thought as well. In 2 Peter, Peter's next letter, he writes, For if God did not spare the angels 
when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. Again, another reference here. And here it is translated hell, but not the, not the final hell. Uh, this is the, the Greek word Tartarus, which is uh, really the understanding in Greek thinking is the, the hell of hells. <laughs> It's for the worst. There's like, there's like the, the prison for the really bad people, and then there's a prison for the really, 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 really bad people. And that's Tartarus, and that's the word that's actually used there. This is a place, an abyss, a prison. And so, Peter identifies it. In verse 20, he says, because, uh, he identifies who's there. Specifically, he says, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through water. There were spirits, okay, from the day of Noah. <laughs> These are spirits in prison that go all the way back to the day of Noah. Now, what in the world happened in the day of Noah? Well, if you know a little bit about Noah's story, you know, the people were real evil. Let, let me tell you why they were evil. Chapter 6, Genesis 1 and 2, it says, When men began to multiply on the face of the land, and the daughters and, and were born to them, or, or, yeah, and the daughters were born to them, and then it says in verse 2, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took them as their wives, any they chose. Underline in your Bible, again, if you do that, this phrase, sons of God. What is he referring to? God had Jesus, right? That's his only son, right? Well, this is used elsewhere. I think it's in the book of Job. It's also referred to these sons of gods are also angels, we believe, fallen angels in particular. Here, they, they took on the form of men, and that verse we saw in Jude, it says they left their, their proper authority, okay? So they did things that they shouldn't have been doing, and they essentially created an evil race. They, they created a race for the daughters of men. Now, I know this sounds bizarre. <laughs> This sounds, some of you are going, oh, I've got to get out of this church, right? <laughs> I'm just telling you what, what's in the Scripture and maybe how the best way to understand this is. But it goes on to say that, again, God was grieved, so grieved of this particular race of people that he wiped everybody out except for the eight. Noah, his wife, and his three sons and their wives. Everybody else is destroyed. Noah preached during that time while he built the ark, 120 years. He preached for people to repent. He preached to these evil people. You know how many repented? Zero. <laughs> wow. I know it sounds weird. And it, it was... A, a time that you and I probably have a hard, hard time understanding. So again, we see the spirits in prison, most likely they're fallen angels from back in Noah's time who possessed men, created offspring that were completely evil. God wiped them completely out. And now those, those demons, those evil angels are held in prison. God, God took them for what they did and held them and put them in an abyss. Crazy thing is, and I can't go into too much depth on this, but there's a time of tribulation in the Bible they talk about that these they'll actually get re-released <laughs> for a time. And we're not going down that rabbit trail. But I say that to say this. Do you ever feel like anything's out of control in your life? Raise your hand, yeah. <laughs> Everybody's hand's going up. Yeah, out of control. I, I, I want to remind you that even when things are as crazy and, and as 
uh, I mean, I couldn't imagine living in, in, in Noah's time and how evil things were actually then. I mean, I, I see things today and I think they're evil enough, and, and, but God is in control. That's what I want you to see. God is in complete control. And if the reference from, from Revelation is correct, that one-third of the angels turn from God and are evil, okay, God's got two-thirds. He's got a bigger army, right? So I think, you know, we, we, we should feel that God, well, we know God, that he is in power, he's in strength. So Jesus, during this time, okay, he's been crucified. There, he hasn't resurrected yet. He is made alive in the spirit. Jesus goes to this prison sometime during that time. What did Jesus say to these prisoned spirits. The Bible does not tell us exactly what he said. I wish it did, but, but, okay, when we look at the larger context of this, this passage and certainly Peter's letter and some of the words that are used, we can get a pretty good idea of what he didn't say and possibly what I believe he did say. And so here, the, the, the Greek word that is used here for proclaim is a different word than evangelize, okay? So this word he uses is not about sharing the gospel per se. It's about making a proclamation or heralding a, a statement out to these evil spirits. So what was the proclamation. Well, like I said before, it's not, it wasn't the gospel. He was not giving these angels a chance to repent. In fact, there's nowhere in Scripture, the only people that have a chance to repent and turn to God from their sins are us, not angels. Only we, only God loves us that much. Kind of an amazing thought. So what did he proclaim to them? What I think he proclaimed to them was that he, Jesus, on the cross, now alive in the Spirit, has given victory over Satan and his evil demons. He has proclaimed victory to them. That, I believe, with all my heart, is what he said. Can I hear an amen to that? He did. I believe this with all my heart, that he proclaims victory over them. Victory over Satan's reign, his ultimate demise. You see, I really believe Satan thought they had him. Okay, I didn't kill all the people in Israel, but we did kill this Messiah. Oh, you just bruised his heel, <laughs> Satan, and he's going to crush your head. I truly believe he's basically telling him, you're done for, you're done. Things are going to play out in my timetable, but you know what, Satan? All your evil and all your demons they are completely doomed. Jesus had opened the veil of forgiveness. The temple veil was torn. We have our way to God now. And he is just saying, hey, we are victorious. We are victorious. Well, that tells us who these people are, why they're there, and what Jesus said. The, the next reference, the next question we may have had was the one about baptism. Verse 21, let's look at it. Baptism, which correlates to this, now saves you, not the removal from dirt from, uh, from the body, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's talking, in a way, about baptism, Okay? When Jesus did come back to the grave and did walk the earth there for some 40 days, and then he ascends into heaven, right before he ascends, he tells his followers, all right, all power is given unto me, right? Go and make disciples, go make followers, and what do you do with those followers? You baptize those followers. He gave a very specific order. So here, Peter is talking about baptism kind of, if you will. Baptism here is, seems to be referring back to Noah, okay? 
And if you, depending on your version uh, of the Bible where I have read correspond, some will say it is the antitype. Okay, so he's, he's making a comparison here, Peter is. And so it's not, it's not tit for tat as, it, as we might think. So the, it's it basically, he's talking about Noah. Okay, Noah is the, the type, if you will. Baptism is the antitype or the correlation to this. And here's what I, I believe makes the best sense. Because Scripture has to, to line up with Scripture. So Scripture tells me in multiple places that I am saved by f- God's grace through faith then I can't be saved just because I got baptized. And so we need to mesh these, understand. And this is why it might seem like a hard way to to interpret this particular verse, but it also, we do it this way because it then keeps everything uh, in line in terms of truth. And so when we think about this, I want you to think about the ark as a capsule of salvation for Noah and his family. A, a capsule of salvation. The, 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 no, the, no, the ark was in the water, floating around, immersed essentially in the water for those many days. It was, if in a way you might say, baptized. That's what the Greek word baptismo means. It means to immerse or submerge, Okay. Jesus is our ark, I think is what he's trying to tell us, that, 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 that we are to be immersed in Jesus. We're supposed to be completely surrounded by him. Remember, I think it's in John chapter 13, 14, somewhere around there, he talks about, uh, about I'm in you and you are in me, Okay. He, he talks about also about being um, abiding in him, that we're supposed to abide in Christ. There's this connection, and we know this connection uh, happens and is we are immersed in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I think we, I want you to kind of think of it that way. So Jesus in this picture is like an ark of safety that helps us sail through the sea of judgment, because that was what Noah was sailing on, a sea of judgment. I think Peter clarifies this even more when he makes this statement. He says, not removal of dirt, or, and dirt can sometimes mean sin, okay, meaning the, that the baptism really does not save you, but what he does say is an appeal to God with a good conscience. A conscience is a thought, right? And we believe this corresponding faith or corresponding thought of faith, believing in Jesus Christ, is this appeal to a good conscience, if you will, that we're, we're trusting in what he talked about earlier, that he resurrected and that he died for our sins. He, he took the, the righteous one, Jesus, okay, who died for the unrighteous us, and now that we are close to God. And so, in that way, this is, I think, where he's trying to take the reader. Let me just kind of summarize the statement, if you will. Noah and the ark are a figure or a picture of those who get baptized, saves now. It points to the faith or good conscience of Jesus, okay? And then Peter is painting a picture of an ark immersed in water and the Christian immersed in Jesus through faith, bringing salvation or saving now. Again, it sounds like a, a, a hard way to interpret this, but it then lines up with the remainder of, of Scripture and what we know about salvation. So, that was a lot. That was fun. I enjoyed it. I hope you did. Uh, but I, it is amazing things, some of the things that we find in Scripture when we dig in. So, let me... Let me, if I can, give you the possible understandings of this. Again, I, I try to do this with most humility, uh, encourage people to continue to dig deep into this, but let me summarize what we just learned, if you will. Number one, the prison is the abyss holding evil spirits from the time of Noah who created such an evil race that God 
totally wipe them out, okay? The next statement, Jesus went to the fallen angels or evil spirits in prison during the three days after death on the cross. That seems to be the time period when this took place. Jesus proclaimed victory, victory. I, I totally, that one I'd hang my hat on, folks. That's exactly what he said to these guys. And that baptism does not save you. Jesus, through faith, okay, in his resurrection saves now. Baptism is the first act of faithful obedience to your Savior, to your Savior. I suspect that Peter's audience probably, when, he, when they read this, they probably had a better understanding of the spiritual world than we do, to be quite honest with you. I think they understood a lot easier than we, it is for us. But even in the midst of this rather complex uh, message, I think, again, I think there's a very simple, a very practical, very helpful message for us. So I want to look at the beginning and I want to look at the end of this particular passage. Look, going back to verse 18, for Christ, it says, also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that we might, or that he might bring us to God. It's interesting here that he starts out here, Christ also suffered. It, that tells me he's implying that the readers of this letter are probably also suffering. That's a pretty good assumption based on the, the study that we've already done so far where he's talked about them going through suffering and that their suffering for Jesus actually brings glory to God and is a blessing to them. He talked about suffering that was associated with uh, being submissive to government and being submissive even to, to evil bosses and submissive in the, in the household. And, and, and so there's all this idea of suffering that he goes, and Peter starts there. He says, even, even Christ suffered. I, I, I think he's making the point for you and for I as well that Jesus suffered. We, we all know the picture that is painted in Scripture, and if you ever watched the movie The Passion of Christ, vividly portrayed the incredible suffering that Jesus took place. Jesus, my friends, is the king of suffering. And I think that's his point. Jesus is the king of suffering in the flesh, and you and I still suffer, but you know what? I take, take comfort in that Jesus also suffered in the flesh. I don't know about you, but I, I, I always like being miserable with somebody else. <laughs> it's harder when you're by yourself. And in a way, I think that's where Peter is trying to take us. Peter also lays out what is considered a very important Christian doctrine in that first statement. It's referred to as the substitutionary atonement, okay? And basically what he's saying here is that the righteous, which is Jesus, okay, sinless son of God, he died for the unrighteous, that's us, okay, that we might be, he might bring us to God. So, again, in the, in the Jewish mind, they had no problem transferring that thought into the whole idea of Judaism and the, the atoning sacrifice that took place on the, the day of atonement for the sins of Israel, and that Jesus was that substitution. He was the perfect Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world, John the Baptist's declaration of who he was. And, and I think it, 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 it begins to help them understand that, you know what, their sins, man, their forgiveness, literally that Jesus presents us to God, the Father, as sinless and forgiven. Amen? That is an incredible, incredible thought. And so I hope we all can find, again, encouragement in that amongst all this uh, rather, you know, hard verses. And then let's go down to the last verse. The last verse, verse 22. Again, he's talking about Jesus who, okay, has gone into heaven now. 
He is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers, okay, having been subject to him. Jesus is at the right hand of God. That is the place of power and authority. That is the place uh, uh, that everybody wants to be, right? (laughs) Unless you're God himself, I guess. So he is saying, though, here that Jesus is in this place of authority, and he has complete authority both over evil angels and demons and the good ones as well. Jesus is in complete authority. Again, I hope you and I, as much as the readers who originally heard this letter, find extreme comfort in that thought. And so let me, let me wrap up this main thought. And the main thought really is your next step. Okay? It, se- it seems simple, but I, I don't know if we do it in light of all of what we've learned today. But basically know this, know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are on the winning team. Amen? Amen. You are on the winning team. For those who suffer in Christ, you are on the winning team. And Jesus knows how we suffer. And there are times when we are suffering because of our faith in Jesus Christ, because we have chosen to follow him. It is harder and harder every day in this culture to claim the name of Christ. But we also suffer in other ways as well, just life and, and, and the, uh, well, essentially maybe it's the evil demons and, and making havoc for us, if you will. But maybe you're Believe, maybe you're married to an unbeliever. That can be really difficult. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. That can be really hard. What, what if you're struggling financially and you, you want to give to the church, but you, you don't have that much faith and it, it, there's this struggle? Or maybe you're this person who's suffering because, you know what, you've made really bad decisions in the past and you're having to live in those consequences. And you're trying to get out of those and you're struggling sometimes to make, continue to make good decisions. God's with you. <laughs> he's, he's forgiven you. He is victorious, and he presents you as victorious with him to the Father. Amen? Amen. We, folks, are on the winning team. We are on the winning team. My hope is, as we understand and we really think about this particular verse of Scripture, all right, that you will find that you walked more confidently with Christ because you know you were on the winning team. You experience, well, hope in life. And, and, and that your steadfast devotion in Christ is closer and closer. And Jesus, well, again, he died that he might bring you and I to God. He died that he might bring you and I to God. What an amazing, amazing blessing and thought that is. And if you have never received this gift, if you've never said yes, whether you're here or whether you're online, I ask you to say yes to Jesus today, that you trust him for your eternal soul. And in trusting in his death and his burial and his resurrection, wiping out and cleansing you for all your sin, your faith in that brings you to God. So if you would, just bow your heads, close your eyes. We're going to pray for a minute. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for the blessing of this verse. As, as hard as it was to kind of comprehend, it gives us an incredible picture of the world around us that we do not see. There is a spiritual world. And Father, we pray as we go out through this life that you would continue to guide us and lead us, that you would help us to remember that you are victorious in all things, even when crazy things happen around us. And my prayer today is if someone, someone needs to know you, Jesus, as Savior, 
that today that you may even voice a prayer even now. Lord, I trust you as my Savior. I'm a sinful person. I was unrighteous and you were righteous and you died for my sins. You took my punishment. You substituted yourself because of your great love for me. And I want to receive that love. My hope and my prayer is if that's you today, that you do that, you pray that prayer sincerely in your heart and ask Jesus to be your Savior. Father, we thank you so much for this time of worship and this time to gather together today. What a blessing it has been. And we're going to continue to worship you uh, through music today and praise you through all our life in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen, amen. Well, we got one more song to sing out, right? Yes, we do. All right. Back in 95, an album came out that hit some hard topics with acceptance, tolerance, racism was one of the big ones. But the biggest one was the bluntness of Jesus, to the point that the title even had what we're going to sing in it. I'm not going to take somebody else's thunder away. <laughs> but in 95, in the world of grunge music and things going crazy and the music industry going, this album came out and hit number 16 on the top 200, not Christian, 16 on the top 200 music billboard. And they were told they had to down their message, and it came out that strong. It's 2022, and the question is, is can we still be that blunt, and can we still send this message that Melissa's going to talk about? So Dan and I were talking, and it's really easy when we're here in church to talk about God. But it's not as easy when you're out in the world. You know, we would know we're surrounded by a bunch of believers. But what God wants us to do is go out in the world and share that message with everybody.
strange before, but I don't even care. People say I'm strange, does that make me a stranger? My best friend was born in a manger. People say I'm strange, does that make me a stranger? My best friend was born in a manger. that service today, guys. A little bit different. I enjoyed it thoroughly, not only because I got to come up here and worship with my church family. I also had a member of my real family here with me, and I want to say thank you. I saw some new faces today. You are such a blessing to us. I hope you had a chance to get a gift from the Connect table. If you didn't, please stop on your way out. They have a little gift bag for you. We're so happy that you're here. I also want to tell you, about something we're gonna do. We did this last summer. It's called Cross Life Cares Camp. It was an amazing time. We did it half day. It was from like three o'clock to 12 o'clock. We had all kinds of kids from Duckett's Lane come out. Pastor sent out an email. I don't know if you guys got it, but we're hoping to get some feedback and some participants. We're gonna do this again. The 8th through the 12th of August is what we're shooting for. So if you guys can help us out, we would love to know about it. You sent Pastor John some information. We also have a yard sale coming up. Carol is going to be collecting stuff here. It's for our DR trip. So if you have some stuff you don't need, bring it here. We're going to use the funds to benefit our missions trip. And I think that that is everything other than thank you again. We are so glad that you're here. What would people do? 